those people who don't. Hello, nice to see you all here. I would like to introduce our next speaker today, Mr. Ian Fordham, one of the UK's leading educational innovators and entrepreneurs, the founder of EdTech Incubator, which is the first uh, national education technology accelerator program. Please welcome Ian with a warm round of, round of applause. Thanks everybody, um, hopefully you can uh, hear me and pick me up. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's one of my passions and ambitions to be speaking or performing at the O2 Arena. So now I've achieved my, one of my goals. Um, luckily, I haven't got a guitar or anything else, so I'm just going to talk about the thing that um, is driving me and uh, lots of others uh, who I work with to really try and change the way we think about education uh, and education entrepreneurship. So what I'm going to try to do today is just to give you a little bit of an overview of our journey so far. Uh, into education entrepreneurship and hopefully depending on where you are, whether you are in education, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you are just involved in startups or whatever to give you a sense of what's possible. A bit of an overview of how we got to where we are here, a little bit of an overview about where we see the education system going, uh, dispel a few myths that we think they're out there at the moment and also finally uh, showcase a little bit as a kind of a pre-launch preview of our EdTech Accelerator program which is going live next week. Um, so I'll give you a little kind of preview, a sneak preview of what's going on. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying um, that in terms of education entrepreneurship, I mean, this hasn't been a linear journey. This hasn't been a place where I've started off and thought at a careers fair at 16, the, gr the thing I really want to be is an entrepreneur. Um, I don't think many people who've actually gone into this kind of space have actually thought that. And so my journey really has been kind of a little bit like this, which is unusual but probably not unusual in the context of startups or people coming into this is that often people start off by having a particular passion. Mine was teaching. Um, I taught a range of subjects, geography, sociology. I even taught sets education um, and I, to teenagers in inner city schools. So I've, you know, I know what that's like. So I've gone through those challenges, but also gone out of that into education charities, into business and so on. So in terms of a journey in this space, it's been not the traditional route. I think often those people who are bringing about change in education don't necessarily come from within education, they come from out of it. Um, but it helps to know something about it. Um, my journey started when I left teaching at a fantastic organization called Education Extra. And there's a picture of a guy here who's probably very unrecognizable um, to many people probably. Um, and it's a guy called Michael Young. And um, who's the father of a guy called Toby Young. And if anyone knows anything about the UK education system at the moment, um, he's a guy who wrote a book called How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. But he's also set up one of the first free schools. But his father was one of the most unbelievably influential social entrepreneurs. Um, he wrote the Labour Party Manifesto post the Second World War, but he also came up with organisations like Witch, uh, the Open University, and so he's a real social entrepreneur and he set up about 50 organisations, but this one was particularly about how do you utilise schools outside school hours. So his observation, his challenge was there are lots of schools that just shut at three o'clock, so what do we do with them after school hours? So teachers go home. So we, I worked for a charity that took that agenda up to the, to the national scale. We went out there, we talked to schools about how they can use their facilities before school, setting up breakfast clubs, lunchtime activities after school, summer learning. So we helped to create that kind of real wave of interest in schools uh, around our school hours learning. And where my co-founder and I, Ty, uh, who's in the audience here, we came together was around another agenda, another big challenge, which was the schools sitting there in isolation in the community, schools as a fortress, created this concept called extended schools, which came from America with a full service schools movement. But basically it was the idea of having other services being provided on the school site. So why can't the school have a GP surgery on it? Why can't parents be much more involved in schools? And we were really lucky to be involved uh, with an organization that were given the job of scaling this policy up. So we worked with six schools initially and over five years we made it possible and made it open to 30,000 schools. So over a five-year period, we actually had to go out there and convince people to open up their doors to a range of other organizations, a range of other people. So two people with big ideas, um, and I think that 
one of the key things I think about being an education entrepreneur or being in the startup space or whatever is having a good co-founder. Sorry, it's a very big face there. Um, apologies for that. Um, and, uh, but finding someone you can work with um, to go through the ups and downs, to go through the, the journey of actually going into this kind of space is really, really important. Um, Ty, when I, he interviewed me first for a job, um, I went through the interview process and my feedback afterwards uh, was, I think I found my soulmate which is probably not the kind of thing you probably want to hear at the end of an interview. So that's kind of like, is that a bit worrying? Is that quite encouraging? But anyway, I think sometimes in your life you do find someone you can work with in such an intense way. It probably won't only happen two or three times in your lifetime, but to find someone you can work with and share that kind of journey. He worked for an organization called Schoolworks, which is all about getting teachers and students involved in designing their own buildings. Um, and then he also set up an organization called the British Council for School Environments, which is about bringing the private sector and architects and designers and teachers together to create fantastic environments. And basically, the idea was quite simple. Again, the challenge was, these people aren't talking to each other, so we've got all this money to build new schools, but these people aren't talking to each other. The architects create fantastic facilities, and guess what happens? The teachers move in, and then they put up walls, and they move things around. So we were trying to bring these two worlds together, and we were involved in sort of creating some fantastic facilities. And the one of our programs, just to give you an idea of the kind of people that we are, um, kind of good or bad, is, is not just the thinking, but also the doing. Um, Ty kicks off a program called The School Makeover. Um, and my strategic intervention was to put the word big in front of it. Um, not just because we thought that was going to go, but just to say, well, this is, what, this is the passion, this is the energy we're going to put behind it. And the idea was quite simple. Lots of people spending lots of money on school environments, um, you know, wasting kind of, uh, money and doing it over a really, really long period of time. So we took a little bit of um, Annika Rice's kind of uh, program and a little bit lots of all these kind of makeover programs, mashed it all together, and then worked over two to three years transforming 15 schools in the space of a few days. So we went out there, we find horrible spaces like this. This is a staff room, teacher's staff room. So if you've never been inside one, that's what they used to look like. It's a little bit like an old people's home. That's where a lot of the teacher staff actually do their teaching, their kind of their thinking outside of the classroom. So in the space of a couple of days, we change it into something else. This is an art room, uh, sort of a bit of a blurry photo here. Um, but basically, always involving teachers, always involving students, and trying to do this at speed. Not just because we think it's kind of an interesting idea, but at the time, there was lots of money going into this agenda from the government, and we felt that the money should be better spent. So can you do it quicker? Can you do it more efficiently? Can you do it more dynamically? Um, and we were starting to kind of get into this sort of think tank space, um, and we produced a publication called Free Schools Thinking which is actually, again, taking this idea, what's the big challenge? The challenge is, we've got all these fantastic facilities out there that are unused, can we locate schools within them? And it isn't a new idea, it's happening in New York, it's happening in many other places, but can we take, for example, disused fire stations, supermarkets? And so we wrote a publication and we got five architects together to actually basically set out how you could use, how you can turn a fire station into a school. There's partly all these fantastic facilities out there that are underused and underutilized. So we started to get, and get into the space, and then we went even more kind of crazy, and we created a virtual think tank. It didn't last very long, but it, it was kind of quite interesting to get involved, just to get the message using social media, kind of a social media virtual kind of think tank. Anyway, about a couple of years ago, um, Ty and I were kind of getting a bit restless, and one of the things that we saw in terms of the education landscape was there wasn't a think tank that was working in the education space. So about 150 years ago in England, there's an organization founded called the King's Fund. And the King's Fund was set up when basically people were dying a lot. And basically the medical profession were going in and they were kind of making lots of cuts and incisions in people and people were dying. So there was a kind of an idea that the King came up with, with maybe the evidence needs to be a little bit better so that when surgeons put the knife in that something happens and people survive. The King's Fund still exists today and it's one of the most dynamic health think tanks. But for an area of policy so important in our country and arguably across Europe and across the world, there wasn't an, in an independent education think tank. And I think like most entrepreneurs, rather than seeing there's a challenge and saying, okay, we're gonna have to go through millions of different ways, we just thought, well, stuff it, we'll just do it ourselves, we'll create it ourselves. So we created the UK's first education think tank. It came out of uh, something called the Festival of Education, which is why I love um, the campus party, the sort of, uh, you know, the Glastonbury for geeks. This is kind of like the kind of Glastonbury for education policy people, a kind of a, a hay festival for educators. And this little kind of pocket entrepreneur here is a guy called Anthony Selden, who again just said, well, look, there's all these science festivals and all these other music festivals. Why isn't there a festival for education? So he put the first one together. And we said, well, look, you meet, have these fantastic people a little bit like today, all these wonderful, amazing people. But what happens afterwards? 
You know, you gather people together, you have lots of stimulating ideas, but so what? So we took the idea of the Education Foundation and said, right, well, we'll create the organization that's going to deliver change on the back of it. Um, so, and we thought we'd take a different approach to it, because a lot of think tanks um, are politically funded, a lot of think tanks are particularly right-wing or left-wing. We decided to create a cross-party, cross-sector education think tank from scratch as a startup business in the middle of a recession. Can anyone see any problems with this? I can't see any problems at all. Anyway, so that's what we decided to do. Um, we haven't got much money, we never had much money, but we put whatever we did into kind of creating the brand, we put the website together for a couple of thousand pounds. We talked to as many people as we could in education uh, who mostly said it was an absolutely horrendous, no, a fantastic idea to do this. Um, and then we created it from, from scratch. And our vision is to create a world-class British education system with two people, with a startup business. So, so I was at the Startup Europe event the other day and um, uh, they said about the Americans and the Europeans having sort of a different level of ambition and the people in the MIT entrepreneurship class being asked, you know, put your hand up if you're going to change the world. If people don't put their hand up, they're chucked off the course. So there's a sense of having a sense of ambition. You've really got to aim high, otherwise, you know, where are you going to hit? You're going to hit somewhere in between. And this has been our experience, this has been our journey, and I'll talk a little bit about this um, today because it's, it's quite a kind of personal journey in the sense of putting yourself on the line and creating something. It is a little bit like this, that you've got a great idea and you've got a fantastic way of creating an organization. As you can probably see, we're kind of a little bit older than your 16-year-old startup normal person. Um, but starting up a business is exactly the same. You're right at the start of the journey. And so all those different jobs and all these different roles didn't mean a thing. You're starting up a business from fresh with a great idea. And so it's a little bit like that. And sometimes we felt like that, hurtling all the way down, thinking, where do we put all the bits and pieces? You know, is this the right thing to do? One of the key things, and we come back to this quite a lot, is space and having the right kind of space and environment to work in, the right kind of people around you to be able to help you, to support you, whatever your ambition, whatever your dream. And we've worked out of a place called the Hub Westminster. And there's a global network of hubs all around the world, and there's social incubator spaces, social spaces where people can gather together, like-minded. It could be a commercial business, um, but it has to be a, a business for social good. So you can make money, you can not make money, um, but you gather together, there's coffee, there's desks, there's lights, there's Wi-Fi, and not much else. But that's where we've been for the last two years. And what's been really interesting, there's loads and loads of business, very few in, in, in the world of education, but in the world of health, in the world of sustainability. It's a fantastic, we've got 400 organizations based there, and it's run on a business like a mobile phone tariff. So the amount of hours you use the space, you can use it. But it's been great to share ideas, to share our successes, to share our failures, and have access to money, investment, and so on. So this is where we're based. Um, and part of the deal of being in the base, um, which again goes back to this issue of entrepreneurship, and if you don't ask the question, you, you, you won't get the answer, is we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to have an education lab, an education space as part of this hub, as part of our deal of being there, so we could reduce our rent a little bit? Um, and they went for it, and they said, yeah, we'll do that. It sounds fantastic. What does it look like? Well, we got loads of educators together, loads of policy makers together, loads of businesses together to say what does this space look like. And we learned lots of things about space and design, and we got lots of architects, we got some furniture companies involved, we got some tech companies. Still didn't get, have enough money really to kind of put it all together, had some furniture and various other things. I just want to say this because, not as any particular secret, but just kind of sometimes with these things you have to do. I've got a, lift, a tiny, weeny little following on social media. Um, and I was looking around and thinking, well, who would be really interested in this? What companies would be interested in this? And I thought, I know, Skype. They'd be really interested in this. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, and um, so I found someone on Skype, and she was talking about education. I thought, okay, so I'll start to follow her. Not, not overly follow her, not sort of stalk her, but just like follow her and sort of, you know, interact with her. And she started following me. So I sent her a direct message. I said, oh, maybe you'd be interested in this. Between sending her a direct message um, and then setting up the lab, three months, and they gave us funding for this. So don't ask for permission. Just go out there and ask it. You know, think Skype, it could be somebody else. Sony gave us, gave us some TV sets, uh, gave us some other tech. Um, so it's possible. And we use this space for events, we use it for collaborations, you know, a whole range of different things. An education and learning lab uh, right in the center of London, just off of Trafalgar Square. Um, we created this as one of our first projects. Um, but we knew that being based in London or just in Westminster or just one part of the country, you know, if you're from other places around the world or from Europe, is, is not good enough. You can't just be in the capital city. 
you know, you've got to get out there and do some work to have credibility. So we took this idea of the lab, which we really like, this idea of testing, experimentation, prototyping, directly into a school. And the challenge for this school was continuing professional development, teachers' professional development. And what I mean by that is how do teachers learn how to be better teachers? And most teachers' professional development is you get sent on some horrible course and you listen to PowerPoint for a fat five hours and then by the end of it, get some awful coffee um, and then basically that's it. And you might spend about 40 or 50 pounds on that a year. And that's your professional development. So what we did with this school is we created, we knocked through two classrooms and created a teacher lab right in the center of the school, owned by the teachers, an environment, a space to test things, to fail. Because one of the interesting things about this is for teachers or for educators or for anyone is where do you get to have a safe space where you can fail at things? You don't want to do it in front of everybody else. So what they had a chance to do was to go into the space, try out some new ideas. It could be maths, it could be science, it could be English, it could be anything. And what you see as a picture here was on the first day it opened, was a group of, good group of students teaching the teachers how to use the tech, which they could then use back into the classroom. Because as you probably know, and it is a bit of a cliche, a lot of the young people know how to use the tech better than teachers. So this is a picture here of them saying, look, how do we go about this in a particular way? Uh, we've now got three teacher labs around the country. Three is fine, it's okay, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. We could have 50, we'd have 500, but that's how many we've got at the moment. Done lots of events, um, and also started to kind of collaborate and grow our network, and as a cross-sector organization, started to work on the universities as well as schools and colleges, because we, we go from sort of naught to 100. And this is a great project that we're involved in um, called University Vision, which is talking about where universities go next. You know, there's all this kind of discussion about, you know, MOOCs and so on, which I'll come on to a little bit later, but where do universities define themselves in this new age? You know, it costs a huge amount of money to go to university now, so we collaborated with 28 universities to talk about different scenarios for the future, the future of universities and, and produce the university vision uh, project and, and document. Um, these are sort of some moments for us as well. You know, a year, into the, year into, the, into the journey, we got a phone call from McKinsey saying they're going to do a, a launch of their report. We said, okay, well, we'll be the London hub. We thought we'd ask, you know, if they'd always say no. So we hosted this fantastic launch of this report. We had live beaming in from Washington. We had loads of kind of people, whatever. And what was really interesting in that hub space, if we go back to that, is we had about four events going on. In fact, it's actually quite like this. Four events going on, and we had lots of kind of quite senior people in the thing kind of moaning at us and looking at us and whatever about this event. But it's fantastic because the big point about this report is that educators, employers, and young people are in completely separate worlds. And what tends to happen is they go down on completely different ro roads on the highway, and they never kind of meet each other. And the point about the report is that they need to step into each other's worlds. And that's exactly what was happening in that event, and they didn't really like it. But the point about the report is the fact that how can these different worlds come together? And that's partly about what we're trying to do. And a pre-preview um, also led us to create this program, which I'll talk a little bit about more uh, later. Um, one of the things that we've seen around seeding innovation entrepreneurship is a lot of stuff going around around education technology. And what we also saw as well is a lot of startup incubators, accelerators and so on that were going on in fintech, financial technology, ad tech, advertising technology, social tech, incubators and so on. But no organizations that were setting up something around education technology. And we went to the US quite a lot to have a look at what's going on there. And about three or four years ago, there were only about one or two. And now there are about 10. And what was really interesting for us is that why hasn't Europe produced an education technology accelerator program? And why wasn't there one in London? And again, rather than asking anyone's permission, we thought, well, we'll set it up ourselves. So last year, we came up with the idea, not a new idea, but to create London, UK, and Europe's first education technology accelerator program. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do um, a little bit later. So. We've got two people working for the organization, so we're thinking, well, we're not hugely busy, obviously, so we'll kind of go and do another program. And one of our fascinations is the fact that when we're talking about education, the worlds of education and business coming together, we're saying, what's going on in cities around the UK, around, in fact, actually, could be around the world, around bringing education and business together? Because often they sit in different worlds. And so we, again, pitched an idea to central government to fund this program called Education Britain. And what was really interesting about it is that, as an independent organization, we never thought we'd get government funding so early in the process, but we came from the entrepreneurship bit of this government, from, the, from this section of the government. And so we ran our first event in, in June, uh, we launched it, which is all about the digital future of a city. 
And we gathered everybody we could possibly gather from educators, young people, makers, computer scientists, colleges, universities, to start thinking about the digital future of the city. And the reason being was that in Manchester alone, there were 40,000 jobs going to be created in this digital industry over the next five years and nobody to fill them. And guess what happened? No one was talking to the schools about it. They were talking to the colleges and talking to the universities, but no one was talking to the schools. So I'm a teacher in a school and I'm teaching a young person. They might be, you know, in science and maths. And all these jobs, amazing jobs out there, and you can imagine, you know, probably actually doing them yourselves, these digital jobs that are actually just in one city alone. And there's 750,000 jobs going to be created across the UK over that five-year period that need to be filled. So what do we do about it? Well, in our way, we want to try and say, well, let's start the conversation. But start the conversation in major cities, in regions, in areas. So that's what we kicked off and we're doing over the next couple of years. And if you hadn't worked it out by now, um, people were starting to kind of say some things about us. Some people not so nice things about us because that's what happens. Some people saying nice things about us. And this is a really nice thing that, uh, that Rowan said about us. Rowan has just left number 10 Downing Street. It's a bit odd being described as a piece of scientific equipment, uh, a Petri dish, but I suppose it just sums up the kind of thing that experimentation and kind of approach that we've got, which is to try out new ideas, to take risks, to do things differently. And one of the other, I suppose, key moments in our organizational life, and we're just shy of two years old now, uh, was a piece of work that, uh, again, through a very, very mysterious process of kind of like, we met somebody who met somebody else, who we introduced to somebody else. Um, we came across this organization, you might have heard of them, called Facebook. And they'd done some work in education in, in the States, but they hadn't done any work anywhere else in the world around education and the use of Facebook. Um, and what fascinated us was, wonder how you could use social media not as a tool for just outside school, but how you could use it as a tool for teaching and learning inside the classroom. This piece of work was commissioned by Facebook earlier on this year, and we worked really intensively with two schools uh, to embed Facebook in the classroom. None of the schools that we worked with had Facebook approved to be used by young people before we started with them. By the end of the program, we created a resource called the Facebook Guide for Educators, so that's the first time they've produced a resource about how to do this. It talks about the use of social media in the classroom as well, because we think that's a really interesting trend uh, to look at in terms of the future of education and where that's going. But also we produced a little video that came out of it. I just want to show you the video uh, of the young people's experience, kind of going through that just very briefly. Yeah, I'm, I'm addicted to Facebook, some would say. Well, I've been on Facebook for about a year. Because, like, everyone wanted to keep in touch. Obviously moving around quite a lot, you want to stay in touch. Definitely a social, social tool. So I use it all the time, tree lessons as well. There's a revolution going on in education in the UK. And we saw how Facebook could be used in a really positive way inside schools and inside the classroom. We wanted to provide something which helps any teacher just be able to pick that up and, and think of some really straightforward, easy to implement ideas. All the focus has been on the dangers of social media. This was an opportunity to look at the positive side of it and actually to use it for what I think is a very powerful uh, potential for learning. We need to use social media, we need to use IT in the classroom because this is the way of the future. I wasn't convinced that collaborative learning can be enhanced. Yeah, cool. Okay. So I thought, okay, well, we'll go with it and we'll see how it goes. Initially, I was quite sceptical, shall I say, as to how it would work. I didn't see how they related, to be honest. I thought the boys wouldn't be interested in using it at all. It's the opposite, the boys really want to use it. I want you to find out on the internet when sheep were first cloned. If you're using a medium that they love and they instinctively know, then you're already well ahead. Do you know who the contenders were for leadership of the Communist Party after Stalin? We know there are some brilliant tools within Facebook, closed groups talking about you know, things that are just for within that classroom or that school group. You've got everything you need for a topic on one page. It generates that sense of flow of one event to another. I thought it was really interesting that how you have a timeline and use it for history. We basically post lessons, homeworks, events that happened in clinic. 
you know what you should be doing. You're making a movie on the iPad. They've been using iPads to make short videos about cloning and the history of DNA. Facebook was used as a platform to, to submit that work and to showcase that work. Boys, you're all done though. I know like a lot of people who didn't really try hard in lessons, then when they get onto Facebook, you know, a lot of people, they have been like a lot more interested into doing their work. I often just like click on the page, see who's like been on it, so I think it does encourage you to go on it a bit more in your free time. Everyone checks their Facebook really often. It means that in your free time, you're sort of passively revising, as it were. Sometimes Sir might say us homework to comment on stuff and look through anything that's been added. So when we go home, any questions we have, I can just ask my friend. There are certain people I don't speak to, they also post things so I can talk to them and I don't understand something and it builds relationships. We've got everything up we need to? Yeah. All done it? Good. Excellent. <laughs> if somebody has a question, they've stopped asking the teachers, that's the funny thing. I take that as a backhanded compliment, of course, but they turn to each other and they say, oh, how do you do this or where did you find that? They work as teams, they don't work as individuals. Having used it, my views have changed. The boys are very engaged with it, and they're very enthusiastic about it and they're, they're getting a lot of stuff put on it and they're also doing the work outside the classroom. Education is something that's the most important thing that anybody can give to their children and the opportunities that technology offers is just really exciting. It's limitless what can happen. Let's use it to connect up UK schools with other schools around the world and really use the power of this incredible global platform. All these countries getting involved in discussion groups and posts and replies. So instead of socially networking, we're sort of academically networking. It's a no-brainer really that the use of social media is something that can promote engagement and can promote learning. It's more interesting because it's a different way of learning. It's the fact that we can interact with each other while we're doing it. You're enjoying it and going on something you like at the same time as learning. I've seen now that they can use it sensibly, they can use it maturely, so we just need to make sure that we're going to where they are to make stuff, to teach them best. <laughs> this will never replace traditional teaching. This is just something that just goes alongside it. Just that it's another tool in your, in your toolbox that you have to teach with. I think if teachers get over what might be a fear of it, then they'll find there's huge benefit in the classroom. It educates me more because it's better than just looking into a textbook. Everyone checks their Facebook really often and it's there and it's done, it's click away. Yeah. Um, you probably couldn't tell which was the state school, inner city state school, and which was the uh, very well-funded public school there. You got know, obviously the language. Um, it's one of the most, I think, and talking, with, talking for Ty as well here, the most exciting project I think we've been involved in, probably in our career actually, is about how you can work to change a culture of a school. And, and bear in mind in terms of the Facebook use in most schools or most colleges or whatever particularly, uh, is probably about 1% or 2% at the absolute most, and whether this be a kind of global issue as well. So to be involved in that kind of discussion, that debate about where schools are in relation to social media and how education can be a social experience as well, it's absolutely key, I think, in terms of where education is going next. And I want to kind of rapidly kind of move on really to, to some of the kind of work that we've done to talking a little bit about this kind of whole notion about where education is and, and, and talk a little bit about our accelerator program as well because one of the things I think at the moment is there's a lot of talk about education, the world, the way technology can transform the way education is delivered and there are some real opportunities that I think are needed to do kind of connect the dots up and make sure that we're all kind of orientated and moving in the right kind of direction. Um, so just a very quick snapshot of the UK education system because I think that in terms of the the size and the scale of the system is actually um, quite you know, extraordinary. And a, a report that came out quite early on uh, a couple of months ago was talking about the net uh, value of the education system as an export business alone. Uh, a, a government report that's estimated this to be 17.5 billion pounds uh, to the UK economy, even more than the export business of the financial services industry. And if you then actually go and look at the Europe-wide um, size of things, you know, you've got 500 plus million people uh, and a 12 trillion pounds GDP per year. You've got an enormous education system there um, and, and an area that needs to be looked at in, in a very kind of different way. But what I'm really, really fascinated by is this debate that's going on at the moment and it's going on absolutely electric pace, which is this whole notion about education 1.0 or 2.0 or heaven forbid, education 3.0 
which is one of my bugbears at the moment, is if we can just get the education 1.0 system right before we then start to look at 2.0. And there's a huge lot of mythology going on here. It's mainly from education technology gurus, frankly, who are saying, look at these old factory schools. They're absolutely horrendous. Look at this wonderful technology. It's going to transform everything. And do you know what? We're actually somewhere in between. My argument and our argument would be we're in a hybrid education system at the moment. If we can get some of the structural issues right in terms of how we deliver education, then we can use technology to transform the way things happen. And I think that's one of the big mistakes that education systems at the moment is that, for example, a lot of schools, and I spoke to a head teacher this morning, are buying iPads for every child before the pedagogy or before the thinking goes on about how to actually use them. And I think there's some real mistakes that are going to be made actually about putting technology and gadgets first rather than thinking about how we can genuinely move to an education 2.0 system. And in terms of the net value of locking education technology gurus away in a basement somewhere and concreting them down, you can actually save billions of pounds in terms of wasted spending on technology. So I'd argue we need to be thinking about education in a very different way, in a transformational way, but we really need to kind of understand what's going on on the ground. This is a slide that I took from the web uh, when people are trying to explain the difference between education 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, and I'm not going to go through it. And the reason being is because just look at some of the wording around it, and you might be able to see some of the kind of flaws in the, lo in the logic. And what they're really talking about is the way in which the web or new technology can change the way in which education is delivered. But it starts to get kind of quite promising at the start, because it's talking about the way in which technology is used or not used, the ways that schools are located, which is obviously kind of certainly, but it starts to get a little bit kind of fuzzy when you start to get to 2.0 and 3.0. And I'm really not going to go through this. And part of the reason being is because we're involved in this big debate at the moment about how we change the way education is delivered. And there's a really interesting debate that's going also about the difference between schools and education. My argument, or our argument particularly, is that until you can transform the way in which young people are assessed and the way in which schools are judged, you cannot change a whole system and make it 21st century. It just doesn't work. You can use as much technology as you want to, but that is, the tw that is the 20th century assessment system, and a lot of people are obsessed by it. League tables, PISA tables, more tables, more data. And what we need to be in a debate and a discussion about is how we go from education, almost 0.5 to 1.0, and then move on, and use all this phenomenal technology, this phenomenal movements and changes that have happened uh, to, 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 to better. Good. And I... I'm also really fascinated in the space around ed tech, um, and Saul Klein, I think, put it really, really well, which is about the age of the internet that we're in. And what he talks about is the fact that we've actually gone through, or actually in at the moment, still in an area of the discretionary internet. So organizations like Google and eBay and others have actually completely disrupted the way in which we access goods and services and iTunes. You can imagine all these different types of technologies is the discretionary internet. Where technology hasn't embedded itself is in those non-discretionary areas yet, but it's getting there. So that's where the potential of education technology is, is in the non-discretionary areas of the web, areas that can be disrupted. And you're starting to see it in higher education. You're starting to see it in health. And that's, I think, is absolutely where we want to try and be talking about our EdTech incubators actually operating in that space. How can we take great ideas that are disrupting the way or improving the way that things are happening in the classroom or in other areas of education and harness that potential for good? It's a really interesting kind of observation, I think, from Saul, who's investing in really early stage businesses and others. I think it's a really important observation. Just a few observations, just, just kind of quickly, um, about breeding this kind of education entrepreneurship or this different kind of thinking in the education system. I think there are a few things that need to be done. Uh, and it's starting to happen. I'll just give you a few examples of each. The tendency for education technology is actually to create a technology that doesn't actually solve a problem. It might actually even create one. A great example of that is the whiteboard, the interactive whiteboard. And my concern with the interactive whiteboard is a phenomenal technology, by the way. You know, it's absolutely, you know, it's really good. Is it's almost like Gillette getting to three blades and then thinking, how do we really innovate? I know, we'll put a fourth blade on it. And there's a danger with the fact that technology is being created that's not actually solving problems, it's actually creating more. These, these things cost a lot to service, and what a lot of schools are doing is they're going back to, guess what, a whiteboard with some pens on it. Okay? And so it's really interesting that people are adapting these kind of new technologies and, sort of move, and using them for their own benefit. But there are organizations out there, ed tech startups, organizations that are focused on education and learning that are genuinely tackling problems that face the everyday teacher on the ground 
and are coming up with some really innovative solutions. Class Dojo is one, a UK-based organization. They actually couldn't find the infrastructure around, so they had to move to Silicon Valley to go into the Imagine K12 accelerator. Phenomenal organization. And basically, they've tackled this big issue about class and behavior. And I know as a former teacher, one of the big issues that was standing in your way of teaching is kids misbehaving. So how do you do it? How do you reward them? How do you reward them positively? How do you link it in with data? How do you communicate this information? It's a way of positively rewarding young people in a classroom on a, on a, on a minute by minute basis. A fantastic, uh, disruptive, solution focused organization. Teach meets, actually very kind of untech focused, but what they are is grassroots teachers organizing themselves. Go back to this issue of CPD, you know, awful PowerPoint you know, talking to you just from the front. Well, they decided, well, that's it, we'll organize them ourselves. So they gather together, five teachers, just talking about solutions. That's it. In a room, call it a teach me, that's it. And they, and they blog it and they put it out on the web. Phenomenal innovation now. It's taken on around the world, not just a UK thing, around the world of people running their own teach meets. MOOCs, um, massive open online courses. Problem, expensive university courses, uh, Again, you, as you know, I'm sure you know, many of the main universities at like Harvard and Stanford and others creating these incredible courses which are open up online to millions of people around the world. What I found also really interesting though, because the MOOCs are kind of quite a recent initiative, is people are already starting to disrupt the innovations. There's this one here, um, 6003Z. Six, I just, just, just Google it or whichever <laughs> search engine you go It's a 17-year-old boy in India He's got to the end of his MOOC course and thinking, well, hang on a minute, where's the follow-up course to this? And guess what? There wasn't one. So he went with his friends to crowdsource and pull together loads of material, and he created it himself. I think it's just fantastic that that kind of innovation is coming out, and it's innovating on the innovation. I think it's superb, and so this might well be another, you know, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these kind of little signals that are coming out and how people are, are, are moving on from these kind of, these are big guys here, Harvard, University, Stanford, and others. Range of startups that are out there. Um, and some names you may be very familiar with, other names you're not familiar with. I won't go through all this, but some of them are UK, some of them are coming out of Wireless, some of them are coming out of accelerators here. Some phenomenal organizations who, again, looking at a big challenge and then trying to look to solve it. These are the kind of organizations that I'd argue are really at the kind of cutting edge because they're looking at solving real problems on the ground and they're massively scalable because they're based around technology. They solve a major challenge and they use technology to solve it. How do you support people like us? Well, sometimes we just need a hug. And I'm not, don't, I, sometimes you do. Sometimes you need support from other people just saying you're doing a good job. Other times you need to kind of do a little bit of things like this, which is the innovators are often at the edges. They're often at the boundaries. So, for example, uh, the very, very famous now because he spoke at the TED event, Sagar Tamitra's hole in the wall experiment in India basically a phenomenal activity that was done where he essentially put a computer in a space, a learning space, and then didn't do anything and just let the young people learn themselves, self-organized learning. It's become an absolute phenomenon. So no teachers involved, just a hole in the wall, and young people actually organize their own learning. It's a fantastic, fantastic innovation. But a lot of these innovations are coming out on the outskirts. Florida have created their own massive network of virtual schools. No buildings, no facilities. What's really interesting is it's mainly tackled at those people right at the top of the end, so those very, very able students who perhaps don't really fit into school, and those people who really struggle with school. That's where it's particularly targeted. But virtual schools are live and running to thousands of young people in the country and in America and other places too. Um, evidence. Um, got a bit of a quote. I'm stealing it from someone else, um, but in the education world, um, there's, a, there's a phrase that's going around which is, evidence is not the plural of anecdote. So and what I mean by that is the fact that just because lots of people say it works doesn't actually mean it really does. So you've got websites like this in the States, Edutopia, who are actually saying, well, what is it that works about that intervention? Can we actually make it and take it up to scale? This is one of my bugbears at the moment. And apologies to people who might fit into one of these camps as well. We need to create a more connected education system, an ed tech system. And at the moment, there's too many divides. And so what's actually been created, and this happening in the UK, and it may well be happening in other places, you've got these different groups that are kind of being created. The establishment, the educators, the schools, the colleges, the universities, and the innovators. The ivory towers, the kind of people who just sit in there, write lots of academic research, and the, and, and the tents that are being created, these wonderful places where people are making 
stuff. Computer scientists. It's a big debate going on at the moment about the computer scientists making the computer science in the curriculum and the makers. Most people out there in the education space don't even know this debate's going on. So my argument at the moment is the ed tech ecosystem needs to come together and actually say, look, what is it we're trying to do together for mutual benefit? A bit like that. Those people coming together, you know, which they're not doing at the moment. They think they're coming together, but they're not. And finally, this whole notion of an entrepreneurial mindset. And there was a lovely quote, um, and I'll probably get it wrong, and please uh, apologies uh, if I get it wrong, was that the difference between the Europeans and the Americans in terms of entrepreneurship is that uh, the Americans start off with the idea of, like, how is this going to make me lots of money? And the Europeans say, let's, start, let's create a startup because it's really sexy. And so what happens as a result of that is the Europeans are really sexy and Americans are really rich. So, which is an observation that was made earlier on this week, which I thought was quite nice. But thinking, and thinking that you're going to change the world, thinking that you're going to be able to make a massive difference, it's an endemic issue. And, the, and being British, you know, we are very, very guilty of this, and saying, oh, well, we could just tinker around at the edges. And I have massive ambition. We should have massive ambition for ourselves and what we're doing with the education system. Um, it's a bit blurry, but I hope you get the point. Um, and a Facebook kind of stolen thing as well, which is one of our mantras as well, is just, you know, just get it done. You know, it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, just get it done, get it out there. And finally, um, just in the time that I've got, I just wanted to very, very briefly, because it's a kind of pre, pre, pre launch, launch, you know, soft launch of, of what we're planning to do next, which is that we felt there was this need and felt there's this gap. And so next week, we're um, doing a kind of more formal launch um, of this, which is the UK and, the, and Europe's first education technology accelerator program. And what we feel is really missing uh, is help and support for those early stage entrepreneurs, the teacher innovators, the educators, the students, the young people who've got fantastic ideas and we can help them to take those ideas to scale. And then a more full-time program that we can actually work with edtech startups and take their business through a journey and by the end of that journey have a phenomenal business that's actually out there selling products to the market. So that's our quite unique proposition, we think. Um, I've mentioned that we're kind of on the verge of this amazing revolution in education, but also why isn't there a European-wide EdTech Accelerator program? So that's something that we're really interested in thinking about at the moment, that people can come to London and participate in this EdTech Accelerator program that we've created, and we can help them to grow their business and solve problems. What we think is also a real USP about what we're trying to do as well is this is not a corporate incubator, and what I mean by that is People coming on our programs aren't going to be coming on their programs to create products for a company. They're going to be coming to grow their own businesses and grow their own ideas. We'd like to invest in some of those ideas. As a social business, we'd like to invest. We'd like to invest some money. We'd like to invest some time to help to take those ideas to scale. But we're not going to give those products then to a major company or then sell them for millions of pounds. We want to make you, those people on the ground, those people who are coming out with the innovations, successful entrepreneurs. That's one of the things that we'd like to do. We've also designed it with educators as well. Those people and education tech startups who've actually gone through that journey, we know what they're like because we're like that ourselves. You know, we know we need some money sometimes. We know we need some cash. We know we need some help. So we've designed it around the needs of those people who are actually creating these businesses. And also, one of the big missing ingredients is trials, field trials, getting out to the customers, testing your product. So we've got this fantastic network of education organizations across the UK that those organizations coming into our accelerator can access. Because guess what? If your product's not great, you might want to test it with some customers and try it out in different ways and improve it and define it and refine it over a period of time. And so just finally, um, the organizations that we're working with, um, uh, we've got some fantastic partners. Uh, Tech City is one, uh, which is uh, an organization that's kind of trying to kind of grow this ecosystem in the east end of London. UCL Academy, which is a, a fantastic innovative school, and uh, City University. These are some of our tech advisors. You might recognize a few of the organizations there who are giving their time, their engineers' time, their techie team time to help support those people. So if you come in with a challenge into our accelerator, you'll have access to some of the world's best entrepreneurs, techies, and so on to help to turn your product into something that we created. We've got a phenomenal network of education partners out there who we're working with at the moment in schools and colleges, universities across the piece. So that's something we can give these startups and these young Young teacher innovators that are coming through, they might be young, they might be old, they've got a great idea and they want to kind of solve it, we can give them access to this, this kind of ecosystem. So it's launching next week. 
I'm going to share some more information about what we're doing. Um, this is a kind of pre-preview, sort of a soft launch, an even softer launch of what we're doing. And we'd be really, really interested to see what your reaction is. This is where it's going to be based. It's going to be based in a school. So the first one, the part-time virtual program, is going to be based in a school. It's one of those issues where it's not going to be based miles away from anywhere else, where for civilization it's actually in a place where there's some real young people and teachers. And you can test its things in the school environment. These are these fantastic super studios they've created. So, final few minutes. Um, what can you do to help? I said all the way through, you know, we've, we're not ashamed at all of asking for help or just asking for stuff, you know, because at the end of the day, you can ask and see when it says no. Um, Ty and I've got a thing which is we'd much rather have a, a short no than a long no. It's actually much better as an entrepreneur to kind of know that you're not going to go through tons and tons of meetings and then be told at the end of it to go away. Just tell us straight away. No, no, I'm not interested. Okay, fine. Go on to the next person. It's fine. So much rather a quick yes than a long no. That's what we'd like you to do. So if you're a techie or you're a coder or if you're in that kind of space, maybe you could offer your time. There's an element of our first accelerator is a part-time. It's a virtual program. We can help you support that way. Secondly, if you're a company, if you're a business, any size, doesn't really matter, small to medium-sized business, big corporate, maybe you'd like to sponsor a teacher to be on that program. Because we're going to be self-funding this one. We're going to be actually looking for funding to kind of support this program. And then finally, start to kind of engage with us, as many others are as well, about our full-time accelerator program, uh, which is going to be kicking off in January. Full-time accelerator program for edtech startups that we're going to take through that process. Um, I won't go through all of them. Um, they're all up there. Um, I've mentioned the whole issue about don't asking for permission. Don't. If you've got a passion for this area of education, the fact that you're here um, listening to me is the fact that you've got a passion in this area, just start something. Don't have to be old like me, or Ty is even older than me. You know, you can actually go out there and make a difference. You can do it tomorrow. You can start off with the idea and you can make a difference. And also, if you are going to fail, try and fail behind closed doors, but do it really quickly and learn from it. We've done loads and loads of things that we've come up with, had a great idea, and then we thought, no, it's not in the right place, we'll just change it. And do that. We've learned that all the time, and listen. Listen to what other people have got to say. Sometimes you'll be asking for money, sometimes you'll just be asking for advice. At the end of a meeting, also, just say, look, have you got some advice for me? Could I have done this any better? And can you introduce me to someone, if you're not interested, they might be interested. Facebook cliche, but actually, um, it's very, very true. We think our journey is only 1% finished, and we're getting quite old. So one of the things that we're doing is also trying to empower young entrepreneurs and older entrepreneurs to take our lead and actually do things the kind of way that we've been doing them as well. Because education entrepreneurs are quite a rare breed, and we want many, many more out there in the system, because there are many, many, many issues out there to be solved. Thank you for your time. I know it's such a Honestly, an honor to really to be here to, to be able to speak about what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. We have a few minutes for your questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, well, uh, this is exactly why I'm here. I'm here because of uh, at, uh, tech and uh, well, I've got a uh, thousand of questions. Oh, uh, well, uh, my first question is if uh, the presentation will be available somewhere because I want to go through it once more. Uh, uh, then, uh, because I'm still studying and I want uh, to study like mixture of uh, education and technology and how to use technology effectively uh, in education, uh, do you know if there is some uh, like un university uh, program for this especially because uh, I'm like now finishing my bachelor degree and I will have to choose my master okay um, thanks yeah thank you no um no we, we're not we don't want to share the presentation we just want to keep it to ourselves no it will be yeah will be online somewhere for you to look at and just have a look at the detail the second thing I mean it's a really interesting question actually is that there are a lot of courses that are done on entrepreneurship and I think um, I'd say you have to do some of it on, on the ground. You actually, um, one of the interesting issues I think around university courses as well is that you should kind of be insisting that you're doing some practical hands-on work as well. So if you've got some ideas 
in terms of where you want to go next, whether it be in your career, whether you want to go in down a startup route or do anything else or whatever, is to actually be doing things on the sides, creating your own startup business. I, I, I can come straight back to you if you just email me whatever, some details or whatever, and, and see if it, but there aren't any particular I, I know of education entrepreneurship courses. There are certainly some things around, but I would argue any kind of entrepreneur, you need to be doing it learning by doing on the job. And often what tends to happen with entrepreneurship is people do it alongside their study or alongside their job as well before jumping off the cliff. Okay, but any, any advice and support that you need, just, just drop me a line, I'm very happy to help. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I've got a question because it seems like the US are much more fo like focused and orientated on monetizing even ed, even ed tech, but the UK and Europe are very different and so much more, they concentrate so much more on the social aspects. What aspects do you think we can like take from, from the US and ourselves to make it more of a, like, be like a better model? Yeah, again, a really good question. I mean, I think the, the sheer volume of, of education entrepreneurships, uh, sorry, education startups and, and entrepreneurs that are coming out of the States is partly a function of the size of the system. Um, there's, a, there's a map uh, which I can direct you on the New Schools Venture Fund site, which is basically says all the different type of edtech startups that are already out there. There's an incredible diversity there. It's, it would, I, would, I would suggest actually starting and having a look at what's already been created, because a lot of the US startups have actually just got their own market to deal with. I think in terms of the making money thing, I mean, really, it's like the same with anything, like a, whether you go down the social entrepreneurship route or whether you go down the non-social entrepreneurship route. I mean, the interesting thing about the hub and all that sort of thing is that you still have to make money, you know, whether you're a social business or you're actually a profit-making business. And I think a lot of the organizations who are in the education space are quite upfront about that they're a small to medium-sized business and they need to make money. You know, obviously, there are some very, very gigantic companies who are making lots and lots of money, but I'd say the key issue goes back to Tackling, a, tackling an issue that really needs to be solved, because that's where the market is. Find out what's going on with teachers, find out what's going on with, with colleges and other, what are the challenges that they face. You know, immerse yourself in those kind of environments, because also the teachers might not have the time to solve that problem, and you might. Hello, my name is Michal, and uh, I'm from Slovakia. We are building education program too there. And uh, we are building it from scratch, then uh, we can learn from the mistakes of the other countries, you know what I mean. And uh, I want to say that uh, you have a really cool project, well done. Thank you. And um, I have a question because we are also cooperating with startup incubators and uh, with partners like, like you. Uh, and um, you said that you, uh, you built it like a startup. I guess that this is more uh, something like a social enterprise, or or it's it's uh, it's not so much focused on a business itself, and uh, it's more like social enterprise. Do you have a prob? Um, did you have a problem uh, to raise or to raise money for for this project or something like that? Because not all investors, on angel investors, want to give money to the social enterprises. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So so. We, we are a not-for-profit social enterprise, but the program, the EdTech Accelerator, is a for-profit enterprise. So I think that there's lots of different types of organizational structures and so on. But I think one of the key elements there is that, yes, VCs uh, and at that end of, of the kind of investment spectrum are very, very interested in things that are much, much more well-developed down the line. American VCs are much more interested in early, earlier stage ventures. So, and in terms of money, it, it's always something that's a challenge in terms of doing something new. What we're trying to do is to tap into and learn from, as, as you would be hopefully learning from us, learning from what's going on in the US, how they've done, they've set up their programs. What we've really learned over the last six months or so in developing this is you've got to have a particular element that you are specialist in because otherwise that you, there's a chance that you might not meet the needs of those people. So the first thing we're doing is setting up this part-time virtual accelerator, which is exactly the kind of group that we know really, really well. We know teacher innovators, we, so we're going to focus on that particular group. But we're also focusing, really interested on ed tech startups who want to come to London and be part of our type of program, which is we will want to try and give some investment, but also we want to make sure that we are developing this business. There's a lot of inter-accelerator work going on as well, so we can actually potentially feed other accelerators as well. Um, and as a startup business, we also know what those people need. Sometimes they do need money, sometimes they don't want to have a stake in the business. But it's, 
like the 1% finish, you're always out there talking to people about money and all those kinds of things, and I can share the kind of lessons that we've learned around that. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to stop here because we're running out of time. But thank you all for coming. And thank you again for your Pleasure. great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.